Hi, this is Dr. Tom Ulrich, and uh, this is my uh, 11th video uh, that's in a series of videos that are meant as commentaries to my handout notes on systematic Bible study technique. Uh, if you just stumbled across this um, video and you're wondering what's that, the bottom line is I wrote this, this handout for, I've been writing it over the last 24 years, I, no, 34 years? I first wrote it in 1984, so whenever that is, it's 2018 now. Um, and uh, it's intended to help uh, people uh, study the Bible for themselves. And you can get a free copy of it at tomorichconsulting.com slash church. At any rate, in this video, we are in Appendix D. The point of Appendix D is, is to make some uh, recommendations on if you want to uh, pursue this further, maybe what books to read. So I've got uh, 10 suggestions. They're kind of in the order of recommendation. Um, at any rate, the first one is How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. Uh, throughout the videos, you'll hear me talk about Fee and Stewart. Well, this is it. And um, this, no other book has influenced my thinking more. Um, you know, I first heard about this Chuck, well, years ago when the first edition came out. Chuck Swindoll was was recommending it. You know, I was listening to him on the radio. And uh, anyway, absolutely fantastic book. It's very readable. It's reasonably priced and so on. Fun fact, often people are like, hey, they misspelled the title. There should be an apostrophe um, in its um, title, all it's worth. And uh, in the... Um, Preface to the second edition, Fee and Stewart clarify that's not a typo. It's not for all it is worth. It's it's pos possessive. It's for all it's worth. Anyway, uh, number two, Living by the Book, The Art and Science of Reading the Bible by Hendricks and Hendricks. Um, you know, back in the acknowledgment or the first introduction, I mentioned that a lot of this material, uh, the popular navigator folklore, is that it all kind of originated with Dr. Howard Hendricks. Well, this was written by Hendricks. He, he wrote this with his son. And uh, basically it's, um, well, yeah, it says a lot of the stuff I say in here, and he says a bit more. At any rate, great book. Uh, another one's called Grasping God's Word, A Hands-On Approach to Reading, Interpreting, and Applying the Bible, uh, third edition. This one is a, is a textbook. It's used in a lot of um, both undergraduate and graduate programs, and it's really pretty great. It's It's pretty thorough. You know, for a textbook, it's only like 35 bucks or something like that on Amazon anyway, which is really good price for a textbook. But it's uh, super readable. It's super thorough. Really, really great. Uh, another one called Understanding and Applying the Bible by uh, McQuilkin. And uh, this one's pretty good if you're looking for one that focuses more on just principles of interpretation. Up to this point, the first three have all been sort of general covering all the topics. This one's really about interpreting. Uh, book number five, The King James Version Debate, A Plea for Realism by D.A. Carson. D.A. Carson is one of the great evangelical uh, scholars alive today. Um, and what he does is he directly addresses this issue. Kind of in the videos, I kind of avoid it. But, um, you know, there's a lot of folks in evangelical Christianity who kind of give the King James a special place. And uh, what he does in this book is he, he really kind of talks about that and... Um, uh, it presents his argument for why that thinking is uh, probably not your best thinking. At any rate, um, you know, if you're really interested in understanding what are the issues in, in this argument, this is probably the best book on the subject. Uh, another great book by Paul Wegner called Journey from Tra The Journey from Text to Translation, The Origins and Development of the Bible. This is a great one, very readable. It's also, I think I first used it in a seminary class um, very, very well-written scholarly, but also easy to read, and it just kind of talks about how the Bible came to be. Uh, another one from D.A. Carson, number seven here, Exegetical Fallacies. This one is tough to read, but if you want to really sharpen your, your interpretive ability, uh, what he does, he has all these fallacies he talks about is sort of common mistakes people make when they, when they interpret Scripture. Uh, number eight here, Methodical Bible Study. This one is pretty significant. Um, I think the first edition was written in the in the 70s. And um, uh, I heard a, a preacher not long ago claim that uh, his book uh, on Bible study methods is the only one that's readable and, and all this nonsense. Every, everything on this list is readable. Um you know, practical as well as accurate, and he was claiming that only his is. That's just nonsense. But um, the thing I would point out is 
This one in particular uh, was from long before that guy went to seminary. So um, it really uh, establishes the nonsense. I mean, when you hear someone who's trying to sell their book and say that's the only book, I mean, just, you know, that's a pretty good hint that you know, there's um, maybe not the most reliable source. At any rate, uh, Trina was probably the first book uh, in, in the modern era of, of, of lay people studying the Bible. And um, on iTunes U, I think Apple might have discontinued that. But at any rate, if, if he, he had some amazing videos that they filmed him in the 1980s in a class he was teaching at, at Ashbury Seminary. Just great, great lectures. You can find him. Uh, another book, number nine. So this one is only if you really want to get into the philosophy of you know, if you happen to have the misfortune of encountering, you know, the philosophers like uh, Derrida and others that are, you know, all texts don't have meaning and, and reader response and all this stuff. Um, ben Hoosier really blows that up pretty good. And um, and uh, number 10, this Tapestry of Early Christian Discourse, Rhetoric, Society, and Ideology by Vernon Robbins. Um, you know, I'm not sure I actually recommend this book. Um, you know, I kind of have it there. There's always somebody who wants to be the police of things and they're going to want to know if I know about social rhetoric analysis. And um, I do. I've read the book. I've, you know, I've, I've done some papers when I was in uh, my PhD program uh, using this method. And uh, I do think it has some things to offer. But to be clear, the method I'm using here is historical grammatical, literal, um, literal historical grammatical uh, as opposed to, to uh, social rhetorical analysis. Um, you know, the interesting thing about social rhetorical analysis is a lot of journals these days, non, non-religious journals, will actually accept articles on uh, leadership, organizational leadership, um, th that are based on scripture as long as you use a method. Like, they seem to recognize, you do SRA, they'll like, yeah, that's an acceptable method. And so it, it, it's kind of its interest is, yeah, you can actually get accepted by uh, scholars in an, a non-religious context using this method. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, if you show up with uh, literal historical grammatical, they kind of like, nah, that's not a method, and I, I don't know what to make of that, but that just seems to be a fact. At any rate, uh, hopefully that's helpful, and uh, we'll talk to you next time.